Getting your students to talk to each other about the things they're learning can completely change the atmosphere in your classroom. Tools like these clickers can help get your students excited and engaged like you've never seen before. I love clickers. I definitely feel more involved when a class uses clickers. But this isn't automatic. Clickers won't promote class participation on their own. In this video, we take a closer look at how an instructor can use a clicker effectively. You might be wondering, how do you write a good, challenging, and conceptual question? A question that'll spur peer discussion. Then, how long do you let students chat before stopping the vote? How do we go about guiding students to understand the rationale behind an answer? And then what? How do we use this information to help guide our teaching? We're going to zoom in on each of these steps in this video. After all, it's not the clickers themselves, it's the how and why they're used that makes them effective. First and foremost, don't leave your students in the dark as to why you're using clickers. The most important thing for a successful experience for both the students and the instructor is that everybody should buy into it. So why are we going to be using clickers in class? It's because learning takes place in your mind, not in mine. For instance, if you can't take what we've discussed and turn it into plain English and explain it to the person next to you, then you don't really understand it. So if you want your students to hate your use of clickers, fail to explain that it's a device to improve learning. They will assume it's a device to track them or to test them, and they will resent that. Okay, but how do you use clickers to help your students learn? The best questions aren't about simple recall. They're challenging and conceptual, and they'll help drive the lecture. I think the greatest challenge for the instructor is to write meaningful questions. There's a tendency to use questions which are not challenging enough. Maybe that's because we all feel good when 80% of the students give the right answer. My personal philosophy is the higher the level at which you challenge the students, they will rise to the occasion. It seems to make the class hook together much more nicely when the clicker questions are part of the lecture rather than, I'm done with something, let's see if you got it. It's not a quiz, it's part of the class. Clicker questions aren't helpful when I'm just repeating what the teacher has just given me. I like to have the questions progress the class rather than just a regurgitation of what I've been told. The best questions that I have to ask for peer discussion are questions that have come from the students themselves. That's really where you want to zoom the clickers in on. Something where it's not trivial, it's not memorization, it, it's an idea that they're struggling with. Well-formulated clicker question should make you think and it should make you address the concept at hand but it shouldn't be too tedious or laughably simple because that's just a waste of time. The power of clickers is that they can get students to articulate their reasoning which in turn can help them make sense of the material. I think I learn better when I talk to other people around me. There's something about debating and in a sense teaching other people when you think you've got the right answer or learning from other people when they've got the right answer that's really helpful in that learning process. Students are learning more and more deeply when they're figuring things out for themselves. But what if students are reluctant to talk to each other? Many students aren't used to participating in class and you may have to show them that you're serious about this process. I often wander around my lecture halls listening to student ideas and asking questions. I let students know that this is what we do in class discuss and debate ideas. And then if it was at the end of the molecule, you needed to do a workup with water because it would be resolved. All right, but we're not going to do that. But it's in the, in the middle, middle, so it's not going to be an OK, so D looks like the best answer. Having your students talk to each other doesn't just help them learn. It also helps you, as an instructor, to see how they're thinking about the material. And I was never able to see inside my students' heads before. Peer discussion and clickers make your students reasoning uh, accessible to you. Gas and dust. To me, those signal new stars. Right. Now you've got them all talking. So what do you do during this time? One of the initial barriers to being comfortable with peer instruction is the strange feeling of standing in front of a classroom and not saying anything. I think circulating um, around the class and listening to what's going on can help you feel that yes, they are on topic and you haven't really uh, given over the class. It's a different way of the students learning the information. So giving students the chance to talk to each other helps them learn and gives you the opportunity to see how they're really thinking. Now you've got the room buzzing with debate. 
How long do you let them talk? So with the system that we're using, we get a count of how many students have clicked in. And so typically when approximately three quarters of the class is clicked in, to me that's a sort of a signal to start wrapping things up. And I all sort of say, well, let, let, let's wrap this one up. So let's pull this together and have a little discussion. Typically, it's best to allow between two and five minutes for student discussion. Sometimes it's the, the noise level in the room has gone down and it's clear the conversation is over. They have nothing left to say to each other and I might as well end it. All right, the results are in. So how do you go about talking with a whole class about the question? I think the more a teacher will uh, facilitate conversation after the clicker question is ended, the more effective it is. After all the votes are in for a clicker question, um, I really like it when professors ask people to defend certain answers. So they don't reveal what people voted on yet, and they don't say the right answer. It's really useful because you get to follow the thought process all the way through. I might say to the class, so irrespective of whether you voted this, I would like to know why you think somebody might reasonably vote E. And this has changed what it means to, to respond. It doesn't mean you believe it. It means that you're actually a good student for coming up with an incorrect reason. The best part, I think, is when they go over why the wrong answers are wrong. You know, you think it's answer A, and you really think that that's why, you know, you've got a reason why you, you chose answer A. And they're like, okay, well, answer is C, moving on. You're like, well, I don't understand why my, my, my answer was wrong. One of the best ways to learn is making a mistake or doing the wrong thing and learning why it was wrong. But what about the histogram of student responses? For the students, I think what is most rewarding is the feedback that they receive when the histogram is projected in real time. But when do you show this to the students? This prompt feedback helps students learn from their mistakes. But you can choose whether to show the histograms to the students immediately or to wait until after you talk about the question. This is an important part of the clicker question, and it depends on how the students voted. So when I have the histogram, there's many different outcomes, and the most common one is it's 90% correct. In this case, there are pros and cons to showing the histogram before having a whole class discussion. Either way, it's important to discuss the answer before moving on. Let's take a look at this. So there's a pretty strong agreement on um, E, none of the above, but I got some Bs and Cs. Um, B is very tempting. I, I like the B. Um, what's wrong with B? Pardon? It's not you, it's big R, it's just notational convention. Uh, as I've talked to students, they always come back and tell me they appreciate the fact that we still talk about the correct process even when over 90% of the students got the right answer. And I think that's important for instructors to know. What if about 70% of the students got it right? What might you do then? If it's 70-30, you know, you, you look at that histogram and you sort of think, oh, they all got it. but. They sure as heck didn't. A third of the class did not get that question. That would probably be a, a time when I might not show the histogram. Keeping it hidden allows you to say, who can tell me a reason for B? And if you're voting B and it's wrong, you don't know that you're in the minority yet, and so you might get that voice. So the histogram is particularly important when the student votes are not unanimous. Sometimes the class will be really divided on a question. There is a mixed vote. Showing the histogram here can be really powerful as long as you don't take the first right answer and move on. If it's 50-50, it's brilliant. You show, the, you show the histogram because that gets everybody excited. Now there's a debate in the room and we have to resolve it. And I try very hard not to be the resolver. So if it's 50-50, we gotta hear voices and we gotta let the students decide. So I'll typically call on someone who gave a wrong answer and let them speak first, and then call on someone who gave a correct answer and let them articulate their reasoning, and then maybe turn to the class and say, so, what do you think about these two arguments? And then I'll wrap the whole discussion up myself and say, this is the reason I favor the correct answer. Center of the Milky Way, and that's a good analogy because it is. So you'll have very different kinds of wrap-up discussion depending on how the students voted. Then what? Clicker questions give valuable feedback to you and your students. What I like most is that it gives me a chance to think about what I know and test myself, independent of everybody else in the class. I think the most powerful thing about using clickers in the classroom is the ability to instantly get feedback about what the students are thinking about the material and whether they're grasping the material. Great. 
but then what? It may be tempting to use clickers as a quick check to see if your students are on board and simply continue with your plans for the day. But they're not just a quiz. They can help you determine how you might continue with your lecture. When the histogram comes up and I do see a, you know, a large variation um, or even the majority choosing their own answer, it lets me know that I'm not the only one that's not getting it. It lets the teacher know maybe I need to change my approach. That's one reason why it's important to make the clickers count only as a trivial amount of the student's grade. That helps the students take them seriously, but not stress about getting the right answer. So here are some things to remember in order to use clickers successfully in your classroom. Use clickers regularly. A good rule of thumb is to use between two and five questions in a 50-minute lecture, or to avoid lecturing for more than 10 minutes at a time. Explain to your students why you're using clickers and that you want to hear their reasoning. Ask questions that are challenging but not too hard. Give students plenty of time to discuss the questions so they can learn from each other. Listen to their discussions so you know what they're thinking. Hear answers from multiple students and solicit explanations for the wrong answers, too. Be savvy about whether to show the histogram during discussion. And use the information from the clicker questions to guide your lecture and student learning. Use the clickers regularly and use them in such a way that people really have to talk about it. Don't ever take for granted that your students learned it the first time you presented it. Students need for us to go back and review concepts, to integrate it, put it in context, and the more we engage them as learners, I think they are also active participants in the process, which is what we all want. Using clickers well will take some practice, but it's worth it. Be patient with yourself as you learn to use this new tool.